Let us pray. What we are not, make us. What we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us in the most precious name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life, who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen. Amen. In light of last Sunday's Super Bowl game, and for those of you who are sports fans, one of my colleagues once shared the following story of a college football team whose starting quarterback was injured. The number two quarterback had not even dressed out due to illness. This left only a freshman quarterback who did the punting for the team and had no experience as a college quarterback. However, the coach had to throw him into the fray. So it was first down, and the ball was resting on their own three-yard line. The coach's main thought was, I've got to get them away from the goal line so that we will have room to punt out of danger. The coach said, son, I want you to hand off to Jones, our big fullback for the next two plays. Let him run into the middle of the line and get us a few yards. Then I want you to punt. The young quarterback did as he was instructed. On the first play, he handed off to Jones. But almost miraculously, Jones found a hole off tackle and ran 50 yards. The young quarterback called the same play again. And once more, miracles of miracles, a hold open up, and there again, Jones was able to run for 45 yards. Confidently, the team lined up quickly because as the fans were going crazy, they realized they were on the opponent's two-yard line, six feet short of the, of the goal. So as the team lined up, the quarterback received the snap, stepped back, and punted the football <laughs> into the stands. As the team came off the field, the coach angrily grabbed the young quarterback and asked, what in the world were you thinking about when you called that last play? The quarterback answered blankly, I was thinking, what a dumb coach we have. <laughs> well, at least we know that the quarterback was good at taking orders. The truth of the matter is, many coaches today do not want their quarterbacks making decisions or calling plays. Even in the NFL, few quarterbacks call their own plays. They are usually sent in from the bench. The ability to choose to make concise and accurate decisions is one of the great secrets of successful living. However, as in football, it doesn't always apply to the lectionary or the preaching schedule. You see, if I had to choose, I would have chosen Mike to do the sermon for today. <laughs> Today's gospel which is a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount, appears to be a stark contrast to the beginning lessons from the fifth chapter in Matthew. During my New Testament studies in seminary, we learned that the Sermon on the Mount began in the fifth chapter of Matthew and ended in the seventh chapter of the same gospel. And there are many memorable passages from that sermon. You've already heard Mike preach on the Beatitudes, which described the character and blessedness of those who would be citizens of God's grace and kingdom, and how it's important for those citizens to be salt and light in relationship to the world. In the lessons from the past two Sundays, Jesus prepares us for the challenges to come as he states, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I want you to know that the entire gospel lesson for this morning, which is Matthew 5, 21 through 37, was not included in today's service. In that gospel, Jesus talks about murder versus anger, adultery versus lust, divorce versus commitment, and oath-taking versus speaking the truth. And he does so in harsh and judgmental ways. That is why I would have chosen Mike to preach today. If I were to preach solely on the text, it would take several Sundays to unpack the richness because the scope is so immense. So I want to encourage you to, read, to read the entire passage when you have the opportunity because it is a gospel of expectation in which Jesus uses a series of contrasts between the outward behavior demanded by the law and the inner attitude of the heart desired by God. The word Jesus uses are, you have heard that our ancestors were told, but I tell you. So I want you to pay attention to those phrases because they establish for us the difference between practical application and true spirituality. You have heard that our ancestors were told, no killing, and every murderer will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his sister or brother is subject to judgment. With this contrast, Jesus goes beyond the outward oral interpretation and application of the law. Jesus implies being angry is in as great a danger of judgment as being a murderer because anger is an emotion and inner intention. You know, my initial reaction to this gospel was, what? Is there no righteous anger? Because I have been angry a lot lately. <laughs> How do we, as a church, effectively deal with all of the challenges coming at us so fast and so furiously. The bombardment of executive order after executive order. The selection of a billionaire cabinet and other officials who do not protect the interests of large segments of our population based on race, gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, religion, or national and ethnic origin. Officials who plan to render ineffective and dismantle strides made to protect people's rights. Oh yeah, I've been very angry. And when I feel it can't get any worse, it does. <laughs> so as I continued, to unpack this gospel with my righteous anger, a passage written by a pastor named Charles Aaron helped me tremendously. And he wrote the following. He says, the law teaches the people of God how to live, how to become the community of faith. Jesus says that he did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. Matthew is not contradicting himself with these calls to obedience like the Beatitudes and, those were, and these words about judgment. Matthew is teaching us. Matthew is teaching us how to be the church, how to be salt and light. Matthew is not contradicting himself and we, the church, to support one another, pray for one another, and help each other to live out this new law that Jesus gives us. God's sanctifying grace and Holy Spirit empower us. We show the world that our emotions and our impulses do not control us. 
God's righteousness can go to the deepest parts of our souls, transforming even our most basic emotions. Then we can bear fruit. Then we can become the salt and the light. Then we can build our faith on love, not fear. I believe we can build our faith on love and not fear. And now I know that many of you, that's not easy to even consider or an easy thing to do. However, it is an expectation and an aspiration. You see, my friends, we begin with each other. Love is sharing in each other's lives. It is our time of truth. This is community, a being for and sharing with each other. It is seen in our compassion and mercy towards ourselves and others. This love laughs with others in time of celebration, as well as weeps with those who are sad or hurt or lonely. Only this kind of love gives birth to a church as community. When we share comfort, healing, forgiveness, and acceptance of one another, we become one together, leaning and depending on one another. As community, we learn that we do not have to bear our burdens alone. We have each other. No matter what our burden might be, there is someone in our congregation that can help. We will, in community of our church, find someone who has walked where we are walking. And this can give us strength to make it through. Now, this gospel teaches that there is another important point we need to see about our faith and relationship with God. God has paid us the ultimate compliment because God allows us to call our own plays. God allows us to make our own decisions. God gives us the right to choose to take action. The Old Testament lesson for today, which was not read, is taken from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, in which Moses said, see, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying and holding fast to God, for that means life to you and length of days. Now, you're probably wondering, how does one know when it is the right time to choose to take action? How does one channel that righteous anger? How does one know that it's time to stop talking the fight and join the movement? How does one make a commitment and resolve to do something to make a difference and bring about change? It is not easy. It will never be easy. You see, it calls us to move beyond ourselves and take risks. Often, it calls us to follow the lead of those who have gone before and are still choosing to act. This is the second Sunday of Black History Month. And as I pondered the questions I've just mentioned, I thought about all the persons for whom we celebrate this month and for those who have gone before and paid a hefty price. How, if not for the contributions of Pauli Murray and others, I may not be standing here before you as an ordained black female in this church. How, if not for the freedom fighters who chose to risk their lives in the fight for peace, justice, and equality, all of us would not have the benefits we so absent-mindedly take for granted how through the indignities faced by the men of honor like Frank Ashford and other Tuskegee Airmen, peace over war would not have been achieved. How pioneers like Virginia Moses and Alma Stokes 
helped to change the face of education in Pasadena and gave And you know, Regina is deceased and Alma is not here today. But Alma, if you are watching this, you rock. Because it's because of your contributions, young men and women were given hope that one day they too could do the same. Many chose to leave family and friends to demonstrate the inner attitude of the heart desired by God. Many chose to leave everything to respond to the call to serve, commit, and make a difference. I like to think that, this, that they discovered what Jesus knew all too well, and that is this. The paths that are offered to us must promise to shape us, build our character, change our worldview, if they are to have any appeal to us at all, if we are presented with a challenge that will change us, I believe we will be eager to leave everything and follow. Now we face an even greater challenge. And the beauty of accepting the challenge is that we do not walk the journey alone. We walk in community we walk with each other. One of my colleagues and a former priest at All Saints, Abel Lopez, once discussed the lessons for today with me. And as we talked about the challenges of the gospel, he shared with me a commercial about the energy drink, Red Bull. Now, I don't know if you've heard about the drink or seen the commercial, which touts how drinking Red Bull gives you wings. As we laughed and compared the commercial to leaving everything to follow Jesus, he stated, when we accept our call to ministry, Zelda, Jesus gives us wings. Jesus leads us into the deep waters and helps us fish so that our nets are overflowing. So now when I see that commercial, I've got one. We say every Sunday, whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of faith, there's a place where you're here. Where are you on the journey? Are you desiring to allow the inner attitude of God? Are you willing to choose to take action and to make a difference? I want to tell you that all of you, when you accept the invitation, should be careful. You see, this community may appear to be safe and comfortable, but it's really quite deceptive. Because behind everything here lurks the powerful presence of the one who calls us to follow and work for peace, justice, and equality, and to do it in and with love. And if you hang around here long enough, Jesus will get you too. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>